penultimate paper on discussion. And it has to do with the topic for today, and that's uh, artificial photosynthesis. And this is, again, a paper that appeared quite recently, but if you look probably at a lot of the references, you'll see that they were, a lot of them were in the 80s and 70s and so on, when people were very interested in this as a, um, as a uh, way to solve some of the energy problems. And this is a, of course, the Council of Chemical Research is a very nice journal to read papers in because they're written not, and they tend to not to be written for, say, electrochemists in this case, but for scientists that are interested in the area. It's a pretty detailed stuff, but it's not written for the specialist in mind. So I always recommend whenever there's a good a Council of Chemical Research paper on a particular topic, that's something a student should read because they tend to write it in, a, in an easy to understand way. So what are, we, what are we doing here is basically it's a review article. And typically these are review articles for constant chemical research are designed for, to illustrate often a particular research group's work rather than say the review of the topic of, as, as a whole. So you'll find that typically they'll tend to focus on their own work or their collaborators' work than others, but they'll often include others as well. So what's the, um, you can see in here, there's a couple of different topics. Uh, what are they, what's the basic idea here? What do they, what do they want to show in this paper? Different ways to produce hydrogen and oxygen right. from water. Right, and uh, with with what method? Photocatalysis, semiconductor, uh, or mostly using semiconductors. Right. They really have to use semiconductors. They don't have to use semiconductors. Well, they actually have to use semiconductors to do the results. Sometimes the semicon they do talk about a couple different things. One is the semiconductors don't necessarily have to be involved directly in the chemistry, right? They can use photovoltaic cells, solid state cells, to generate electricity to s split water. Uh, they sort of dismiss that right away. Why is that? <laughs> They dismissed that idea. I mean, you can think, okay, I've got a solar cell, just like the space station uses. I make electricity. Why can't I just hook my electrodes up to uh, water and generate hydrogen and oxygen that way? What's the problem there? It's not efficient. Yeah, it's not particularly efficient. So we're losing efficiency from the, we have to convert the light to, to electricity, and then we have to do another inefficient or less efficient stage to convert the electricity to, to um, hydrogen and water. What, uh, what, so what's the other? So that's one way of doing it. So they illustrate that in figure, uh, figure one, A. What's figure B telling us? Immersed into the aqueous system. Right. Well, figure figure B is something we didn't talk about today, but it's uh, it's essentially using that same semiconductor photovoltaic cell, but directly in the solution, rather than uh, external to it. So it removes one, at least one of the inefficiencies in the system. But again, that's not one they're going to consider. So figure C and D are the types that are really uh, they're most interested in, aren't they? And if we have an N-type semiconductor, we talked about that today, how we could use an N-titanium dioxide to generate oxygen efficiently. And then the other electrode can generate any number of reduced species, but if it's water, it's going to be producing hydrogen, typically. And the, the dye layer idea we also talked about, using a dye to more efficiently capture the solar energy. Uh, 
And what do they say? What's the, I mean, what's the main problem with all this stuff? Is it a cost problem or is it an efficiency problem or, or what? Well, what, they, what do they say? They want 10% efficiency um, to, get, to get the system to go. It said, um, what did I say? This means that the hydrogen and oxygen produced in the system have a fuel value of at least 10% of the solar energy incident on the system. That's on the first page. Number, number. Um, well, you can see um, there are a couple of different ways. The electrolysis of water. They're talking about in uh, in Figure One A. They're talking about electrolysis of water. It, says it requires significantly more value or larger values than about the 1.23 volts. So you need a, an extra over voltage for that reaction to go. Um, Solar voltaics can only currently produce electricity at competitive prices, and hydrogen from water electrolyzers is significantly more expensive than that produced chemically from coal or natural gas. So um, if they're saying basically it's cheaper to use the electricity for some other reason than to make hydrogen out of it. You know, if you're going to make electricity using photovoltaics, it doesn't make economic sense to make hydrogen out of the, um, the alternate system is figure 1B is they use the semiconductor immersed directly in the aqueous system. One, one example was they said uh, they used uh, silicon spheres in glass and they have a, a little layer in the back that's conductive and so each little sphere produced about half a volt of electricity and then you could um, add these together to get more voltage out but uh, not particularly, uh, probably not very uh, cheap. Most of them are going to be using this idea we talked about today which is the generation directly of holes and using those holes to directly produce uh, the oxygen because that's really the limiting case on, on pretty much all the water electrolysis systems. The hydrogen can produce very efficiently at platinum electrodes or electrodes that are catalyzed with platinum on it. Oxygen production is the slow step in all of these systems and it requires a large over potential. It's not very slow. So if we can have some process that produces oxygen efficiently, we can do these systems efficiently. So that's pretty much always the, the struggle is to produce oxygen. Um, and in fact, the titanium dioxide electrodes started in uh, 1972 and which is the first time anybody reported this photoanodic current and that really drove a lot of things and so that's a little bit old now but you can imagine that before 1972 people didn't even think about this problem because there was no experiments to even show that this is possible. So they have lots of different titanium dioxide. Uh, titanium dioxide is nice because it's very stable. The problem is, again is the titanium dioxide has this high band gap. It doesn't have enough stability, it doesn't have enough, um, there's not enough light in that band gap to really drive the reaction efficiently. Um, all right. In part D it talks about using semiconductor particles. So it says you can use titanium dioxides, and what you do is you put on the titanium dioxide some little particles of a catalyst, such as you can deposit a small amount of platinum on the particles, and those little platinum acts like metal electrodes, and so those are the ability to use uh, the electrons that are developed in the overall process.
process accumulate on the platinum and then that platinum can efficiently uh, react with hydrogen ions in the solution. So that your water acts as your electron sink in the overall process. So titanium dioxide, the reaction on, uh, on the, um, the, to make oxygen with the water, then the water also gets reacted with the, on the platinum on the system. So as I said, it uses the use of particles to destroy organic and to plate metals from wastewater, that's number 11. For synthetic purposes, of course, the nice thing about that is that they can make these particles and they can put them in a tank and they can stir them up so you get a large number of particles and you can react that with a, you know, say, high, uh, what you could do is you could take your slurry of waste and mix it with their particles and react it through a, a UV light source and probably in a very short period of time you'll be able to re remove the organics. Um, and the, the semiconductors can be collected and regenerated and, and used again. One of the things that's interesting is that they talk about using smaller particles, they call nanoparticles, often called Q or quantum particles. You might hear about that sometimes, a Q particle. Um, what happens then is that the, uh, these Q particles have because they're so small, the electrons do not act like they do in the bulk system and so the band gaps energy is changed and so you can tune the energy of the band gap somewhat by changing the size of these particles. Uh, but they're a little bit tricky to make. They talk about dye layers. Um, with a thin dye layer, even in dyes and high extinction coefficient, only a small fraction of the instant photons are absorbed. So the overall solar efficiency tends to be small. Um, and so what they're talking about is that the photons either get absorbed by the dye very inefficiently or by making a very thick dye layer. Now those holes that are being made in the dye do not get transferred to the semiconductor very efficiently. So there's a trade-off. We talk about using very uh, porous titanium dioxide to help that process out. That helps a little bit. Um, the sensitizer is often the problem. The problem is the dye itself can be oxidized by those holes that are made and that is often a limiting factor in these particular processes. Um, and they talk about catalytic cycles. Uh, we're getting towards where you can um, rubipi as a sensitizer and methylbiologen as a relay, so they're using this cycle to do a catalyst and what they're using as a, as a material that can form an excited state and that would be rubipi and a material that acts as a mediator between that excited state and the material that you're really interested in. And so they're using um, Methylbiologen is a, a redox acceptor molecule. And they make hydrogen on colloidal platinum and they use EDTA as a sacrificial oxidant. Oxi or, uh, sac sacrificial reductant, I should say. And um, no. And they're talking about using self-assembled uh, materials in which you're using these self-assembly things we talked about to generate particular layers and types of compounds. And so. Despite the inherent difficulties encountered in attempts to optimize the oxidative and reductive half-reactions in solution phase systems, it is clear that impressive progress has been made. Nonetheless, combinations of such half-reactions to a more complex array capable of water splitting have proven to be difficult. So, so it's still, they can do reactions in which certain where you artificial reactions where you add compounds to the system to do, as we talked about, an electron sink or source, but water itself still remains difficult. And so they're talking about in that case, to make hydrogen, that's not the problem. The problem has always been to make oxygen out of the system. All right. Problem of accumulating multiple redox equivalents for the oxidation reduction half.
attractions. Um, heterogeneous arrays they're talking about. One possibility is use of multi-junction devices such as a bipolar cadmium selenide, cobalt sulfide, semiconductor photoelectrode. Um, and um, so basically they end up with saying we need somebody to make a big breakthrough to really get a <laughs> thing going. So, um, but they made, you know, there are lots of, lots of progress, but uh, nothing yet has got to the point where they can really say, okay, we can do it. Um, and I think the, the problem is the identifying of a particular, the, I think the chemistry is, is, is probably not what needs to be optimized at this point. They need to optimize the fundamental physical ability to capture light and to put the material in the, in the proper positions to do the reactions. Chemistry is the, is the chemistry, but they need to, like I said, they're talking about using mic micro heterogeneous uh, arrays and, and so on. But it seems, it seems possible, you know, anytime there is enough energy available to do something, and that's, and there is enough energy in the solar spectrum to, to split water. And the problems appear to be primarily, um, uh, you know, engineering ones, how to implement that particular process in a cost-effective way. And so I think those types of engineering problems always, pretty much always seem to, to yield a, a, a eventually to, to science and to engineering. So. But I don't think any time in the next few years we're going to see anything like that. People are, uh, that's what people are really working on it, and again, energy is so cheap anymore that the question is there's not a lot of uh, resources being put into it. But as soon as energy becomes expensive, you'll see a lot of people doing this stuff again. Well, I guess we'll quit. and. Um,